Well, it's two o'clock. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I am Barry Joyce, Vice Chairman of the Derbyshire Historic Building Trust. Um, the Trust is extremely grateful to Ron Common, the man without whom this amazing project would not have happened. Um, he's the very well-deserved recipient of this year's Derbyshire Historic Buildings Trust Conservation Champion Award. And you... ...in the chat box. And could you please keep... ...your computers muted? Over to you, Ron. Thank you for that kind introduction, Barry, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it may surprise you that this is my first public talk on the project, so I hope you don't mind being the guinea pigs. I've selected 170 images and five videos for this uh, presentation, uh, and some of those uh, photographs have been donated by others. So I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to uh, Hugh Potter, uh, Becky Coleman, and everyone else who has uh, contributed over the years. So this afternoon, my intention is to share with you this incredible journey we've been on over the past five years to get to this point. I think it's a Derbyshire good news story, um, simply because of the amazing, amazing spirit and collaboration that have emerged as the, uh, the project progress. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. I don't know if has got um, the volume on. If you can just mute. If everyone can mute, please, that would be really helpful. I'm trying to keep on top of everything, but if you could do it yourselves, that'd be great. Thank you. So, um, OK, let's get started. So where is the cottage? Um, well, there's no road to it. It's, um, it's along the Cromford Canal, midway between Cromford um, and Watt Stanwell. But if you'd like to visit, there's uh, three ways you could do it. Um, there's a car park at the Cromford Wharf, um, and it's about a mile walk along the canal to the cottage. Uh, there's also at the south end, there's Watt Stanwell Railway Station, there's a car park there, and there's equally a very lovely walk along the canal. And the third option is you can drive round to the High Peak Junction car park, and it's a much shorter walk to the cottage from there. So a bit of history first. Um, in 18... <laughs> In 1800, uh, Peter Nightingale, who was Florence Nightingale's great uncle, and he was an industrialist at the time of Arkwright, he was given permission to build a new branch of the Cromford Canal. And today it's called the Leeward Arm, and you can just see it on the photograph on the bottom right. Uh, because he got cotton mills at Lee Bridge, today it's uh, John Smedley's, which Nightingale built in 1784. He also had quarries and lead works further up the valley, as well as a hat factory along the, uh, along the arm which he, he built in 1793. But it was a key condition of the construction of the Leeward Arm that um, the water level was maintained at least 12 inches above that of the Cromford Canal. And that was to ensure that the water, no water was taken from the Cromford Canal into the Leeward Arm. Uh, they had to build a, a stop lock at the entrance to the arm. Um, and the operation of that lock would need to be supervised by a lock keeper and that's the reason that Aqueduct Cottage was built. OK, now, I sadly haven't got time to go through um, uh, the history of the Leeward Arm, but there's a book that, that's recently been published by Hugh Potter, uh, which covers the topic in some detail, and you can get that through the Friends of Cromford Canal. It includes a chapter on the likely design of the stop lock, um, which is a feature we're hoping to reinstate at some point on the cottage, because that sets the context of why it was built. To get an idea of the beautiful setting of the cottage and, uh, and how importantly how it came in to um, be owned by the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust, here's a short video. Um, the, uh, the captions may be slightly difficult to read, but you'll, you'll get the gist.
Okay, the video mentioned Derwent Weiss programme. Um, this was a five year heritage lottery funded project hosted by Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. It consisted of a wide variety of cultural and natural heritage projects aimed at in inspiring people to get involved in caring for the Lower Derwent Valley. I joined the Derwent Weiss team as a volunteer in 2016 and was asked to look at the cottage project. My original remit was to uh, assess the restoration options in something called the Mansell Report and recommend, uh, with a supporting business case, which option was the most suitable for the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. And that was it. I was given three to four months to submit the report, and that was going to be the extent of my involvement. <laughs> so I thought. Um, my first step was to read the report, which had been brilliantly produced by Pippa and George Mansell, and it made absolutely fascinating reading. I was amazed by the history they'd uncovered and the, um, the, the wonderful old photographs, family stories, um, and um, that was included in the history section. So here's a few extracts from that report. There was a full chronology of dates of the nightingales and what happened um, in the valley and, and around the cottage at the time. Part way down the left hand side, I think you can see 1802 when the cottage was built, um, over to the bottom right, um, 2012 when the cottage was uh, and the uh, Lee Wood was gifted to the, the Wildlife Trust. Here's a lovely photo, reputedly of Florence Nightingale herself uh, driving her fly over the Cromford Canal at Chase Bridge. There's a lovely one of the cottage covered in ivy. Um, it says 1909 or earlier. It's possibly a little bit earlier because the central window there was actually French doors style and they were replaced around about 1900 with a, a window to match the rest of the cottage. And all the ivy was removed, so this is it a bit later, with members of the Eaton family. I'll come on to those in a bit, but the Eaton family lived at the cottage for around 60 years of its 170 year occupancy. And here's one of the boats, this one's Thistle, which is well known by um, many, has been uh, one of the boats that used um, the Leeward Arm. And this would be around about 1930s, I think. And well, you see a fairy tale cottage, this is it. Um, here it is in around uh, 1930. And Violet Farnsworth and her husband Thomas lived in the cottage to 1946. Now this collection of photos, uh, looking at the top right, um, that young lady sat on the bale with the mother is Faye Bark, um, who lived at the cottage as a teenager um, in the 1950s. And there's a sweet story I'll tell you about her uh, a little bit later. And a, a brother uh, there, the bottom photo is Frank Bark, who in later life became the mayor of Worksworth. And this is one of my favorite photos. Um, this is Mr. Bowler, the last person uh, to live in the cottage he left in about 1968. Uh, of course, the cottage completely um, had no connected services whatsoever. Um, here he is with his uh, wooden yoke on his shoulders and his bucket's going to fetch his water from High Peak Junction. Super, super photo. Um, and finally, here's a collection that shows the decline of the cottage uh, from 1966, just before it was vacated, through to 1988 when the roof was about to collapse. So having read the report, um, I was hooked. And, and the next uh, step for me was to go and visit this cottage. And when I got there, um, I could hardly see it because the, um, the cottage was totally shrouded in trees, uh, completely hidden actually. Um, and uh, in the summertime, you could, you could barely see it. When I finally got close, I could see how much it had deteriorated. It was a total ruin. Um, spot the tree growing out of the corner of the, uh, of the building. And it now made sense to me why the structural survey commissioned by Chris Pike Associates 
in Telford suggested that urgent stabilization was needed to avoid you know, parts of the building collapsing completely. But my abiding memory from that first visit was a realization that given the cottage's important historical roots, which I'd read about, its stunning natural location on the Cromford Canal, <clears throat> that there was, uh, must be a strong case for it to be saved. I had no idea how to do it because I got no experience, um, but I felt confident it could be done. So the next step <clears throat> uh, was to clear the trees from around it because that had been recommended in this Chris Park uh, report. Um, but there's no money available at the time. Um, but thankfully, um, the Office of Wildlife Trust Kate Lemon, who was a reserves officer for Lee Wood at the time, um, she organized a working party uh, and it's, that was in the November to start clearing the trees. We started with the, the front and then the rear. It was more difficult at the rear because they were leaning over the cottage. So um, Dave Savage had to climb up the trees, attach a rope and pull that back to a winch uh, to pull them back as the trees were cut to stop them falling onto the building. But eventually they were all felled and cleared. And for the first time in decades, the cottage was visible again from the towpath. Now, one thing that struck me as we were clearing the trees in the November, the number of people who stopped to inquire about the cottage or share their memories, uh, some going back decades, um, there was a real affection for the place amongst the local people and also a great sadness because they'd witnessed it um, declining over decades. Um, and there was obviously frustration as well about the lack of information, but they're really, um, really keen. There was a strong desire for it to be something positive to be done with the building. So that's when I had the inspiration to start a Facebook page uh, by, so I could actually feed back some of the information that I was aware of. And on the 8th of December, 2016, the Friends of Aqueduct Cottage was born. And what a good decision that turned out to be because the story of this restoration really grabbed the imagination of people, not just in, in the local area, but around the world. Today, there are over 3,400 members, members across 40 countries following this project, this humble little project. Um, updates are posted most weeks, and that's happened since its launch. Um, but crucially, this community has raised around about 28,000 pounds via three crowdfunder appeals towards the restoration. That's about a third of the total money that's been raised. Not to mention countless offers of free materials, services, people giving their time. It's just been amazing. Now, over the years, there's been about 2,000 photos have been posted uh, on the site. Just week by week, we explain um, the evolving story of the restoration. I catalogue every single time we're there um, and then share it on, on the Facebook page. And that's, uh, that's uh, actively followed. Now, it's said that the, the Aqueduct Cottage is the most photographed building on the Cromford Canal. Um, to my mind, it must also be one of the most painted, because here is a selection of some of the fantastic uh, paintings that people have done uh, and submitted um, as the project's been progressing. It's also been modelled. There's a beautiful example by um, David Wright, and there's at least two poems, to my knowledge. And every now and then, we come across a gem of a photo, like this amazing example taken in 1894, showing eight of the 10 members of the Eaton family who lived in the cottage. It's one of the oldest and clearest photographs we've got in the whole collection. We came across it just by chance. Um, a lady called Karen Meller and her family were walking along the path and stopped for a chat at the cottage. The photo, as she explained, had been given to Karen by her late father. Um, and after their visit, their daughter was with them who had an interest in ancestry, um, traced their family tree back five generations to this family in the photograph. <laughs> a lovely story. And here's the family tree that uh, Lana put together. There's the five generations. And that's Jay, uh, Karen and Lana, uh, who got involved with the, um, they obviously felt a connection with the place after that, and they, uh, they got involved with the restoration afterwards. Absolutely brilliant. I also shared any interesting stories I came across on the site. Um, and one of my favorites is this one about a, a photograph that originally appeared in the Times newspaper on the 9th of October, 1936. The same, it was an article to do with waterways and how they were moving over to, to leisure from, from carrying uh, uh, cargo. Um, 
the same photograph was pinched by uh, the Nazi Germany's supreme command of the armed forces in World War II and used in their publication Operation Sea Lion, which was the original German plan for the invasion of Great Britain. <laughs> so amazed by this, um, I tracked down an original set of the 13 volume invasion plan to the Cecil Green Library at Stanford University in San Francisco. And I got in touch and they came back and confirmed that page 147 of volume eight, the photo in the bottom right corner, um, shows Cromford Canal and Aqueduct Cottage. So no doubt the delights that the invaders could look forward to. Absolutely bizarre, but, um, but lovely. Okay, so not everybody uses Facebook. So there's also a, face, a website, which my son Oliver has kindly uh, set up for me and I'm gradually transferring information onto that. It has a photo gallery uh, showing both the historical photos uh, and around about 150 at the moment from the restoration, I'll be adding more. Um, it has a blog page uh, and a document library, which contains the history section of that fantastic Mansell report um, and two fascinating interviews with um, uh, people who lived at the cottage 70 years ago and 100 years ago. So coming back to the timeline, um, my recommendations to the Wildlife Trust were submitted at the end of January 2017. And it was to restore the building uh, as a dual purpose information center and activity stroke training room. The interpretation would be on the ground floor, which would explain the history of the cottage, um, Lee Wood and the wildlife in the Derwent Valley, and then a rentable space on the first floor for community groups to use and wildlife trusts to use for events. And that would generate a little bit of income towards its upkeep. So it was a, a joint heritage and wildlife conservation project. That was the proposal. And it's based on the cottagers' historical connections to the nightingales, the story of the water in the valley, um, plus the opportunity provided Derbyshire Wildlife Trust to share its vision for a more biodiverse Derwent Valley. And in February, the following month, they confirmed their acceptance of the proposal but they stopped short of launching the project at that time because of a lack of resources. But they did agree that the urgent stabilization work that was recommended in the Chris Pike, Chris Pike report uh, couldn't wait, and so we needed to get on with that. So Andrew Churchman, a local bill, uh, 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 restoration specialist, was approached to do the work which he did. And later that month, in fact, Andrew's team propped up the walls, which had partially collapsed, filled some of the more serious holes, uh, and boarded up the doors and uh, door and windows. <clears throat> the idea of the stabilization was to prevent the building from collapsing, obviously, until we raised the money and obtained planning permission for the restoration. It basically bought us time, which um, was two years, in fact. Okay, moving forward three months, a, a couple of lovely things occurred in May, which helped raise awareness of the cottage and its social history. Uh, the first was a visit from Faye Bar. Remember that young girl sat on the bale I mentioned earlier? Uh, Faye's on the right here. Um, she, Faye is one of the few surviving occupants of the cottage. Um, and it was through her daughter, Miranda, on the left, who was a member of the Friends of Aqueduct Cottage, that the visit was arranged. A great photo. It was Faye's first visit back to the cottage in over 60 years. And as you can imagine, it was a bit of a tearful reunion. During her visit, um, Faye also agreed to give a living history interview, which we did at the Cromford uh, uh, Wharf Cafe, about what life was like living at the cottage, bearing in mind it's completely, there's no connected services whatsoever, um, as a teenager in the 1950s. And a transcript of that interview um, is on the cottage website. I actually had five questions for Faye and she spoke with absolute clarity for, <laughs> for an hour. It was brilliant. Uh, before she left, um, uh, Faye also handed me four superb sketches she had done of the cottage, uh, showing in great detail everything that she could remember uh, that was in the house or around the house at the time. And here's an example of one of those sketches. Look at that. Just fantastic detail. And I just draw your attention to the, um, the, the kitchen. It said the terracotta tiles were red and black. And when we started to clear out the cottage, I couldn't wait to dig down the, the, the sort of three feet of soil and see if they were still there. And they were. It was a great experience meeting Faye, um, and she, I think, thoroughly enjoyed recounting the memories um, of, of uh, her teenage years there. Uh, and for me, she brought the cottage back to life, uh, and it was absolute joy. 
I also gave her a personal promise that we would restore her former home. Okay, the, the other exciting event that happened that month was when we added the window into wildlife paintings, which uh, I think people will remember. A few weeks earlier from this, I'd inquired on the, uh, the cottage page if any local artists would like to help us uh, in a painting project to, to cheer up those dreary boards, uh, and four came forward. Uh, this is Abigail Sawyer on the left, Ruth Gray, Mandy Elfors, and Joanna McPherson produced uh, six wonderful paintings based on a, a Leewood wildlife theme they were given. And these paintings, they were mounted in the June and they would remain the face of the cottage for the next two and three quarter years. Then in the second half of 2017, um, things went a bit quiet in the project for several months until early March 2018, when two things happened which triggered the turning point. The first, um, I'd learned from Peter Kay at Lee Hurst about the Florence Nightingale Bicentenary celebrations in 2020. And I passed this information on to Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. And we agreed that it was a good target date to have the cottage restoration either completed by or making good progress. That was the first thing. The second thing was that a meeting took place between the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust and Derek Latham from the DHBT. And I'd previously introduced Derek to them. And at the meeting, Derek kindly offered uh, DHBT support. So they were able to provide the guidance to navigate uh, the planning process for a listed building and also oversee the restoration. And this offer of help gave the confidence to Derbyshire Wildlife Trust to go forward. It was a defining moment that changed the course of the project. And on the 28th of March, uh, as you can see on this, this poster, um, I received a note from the Wildlife Trust confirming their intention to set up a joint steering uh, group for the restoration. And that's what they did. And on the 1st of June, we had our first meeting um, and we've done so most months uh, since then. And the members are at the top left is Alex Morley, who's the Living Landscapes Officer for Lee Wood. Um, bottom left is Lisa Witham, uh, who's um, head of Wilder Communities. And uh, she'd been responsible for the corporate funding for the project. Uh, top middle is Ian, Ian Hooker and below myself, and we're um, members of the public volunteers. And then top right is you know, James Boone, who has managed all of the planning process, uh, provided project trackers for us as a team. He manages all the technical uh, discussions um, on the build. And he's done all that actually in his own time for the past three and a half years. So later on in the year, I think this was October, and those lovely discovery days uh, talk, very well attended meeting, where Derbyshire Wildlife Trust announced their intention to restore the cottage um, as part of a broader project to improve Lee Wood for visitors. And shortly after this meeting, we received donations of £800 towards the planning fee, and half of that came from the Friends of Cromford Canal. It's one of those collaborations I was I mentioned at the beginning. So, 2017 and 2018 uh, had been the legwork years, um, and then 2019 is when it all came together. It was in the February, James completed a superb uh, design and heritage statement and, and submitted the planning application to Amber Valley Borough Council, and uh, that application was supported with a letter from Adrian Farmer on behalf of the Derwent Valley Mills World Heritage Site, because the cottage is inside the World Heritage Site. Then in the March, uh, and some people might remember this, um, thanks to help from Liz uh, Stoppard and DHBT, we held two photo exhibitions at the old blacksmiths in Worksworth uh, to showcase the plans uh, and to obtain public feedback and uh, support for the project. Here's some of the displays <laughs> we arranged, I think, in a, an evening, uh, and some of the people that uh, turned up. And at this event, we also advertised our first Buy a Brick fundraising campaign, which Kate Levin and I came up with. Um, the idea being that for a donation towards the restoration, people would receive uh, a certificate with a unique brick number, the, the name on it. Um, and um, in a way, it gave people their own personalized stake in the restoration. I actually got the idea from the Bell Petit Rooms. It had done the same thing a few years earlier. So here's a certificate uh, for 25 pounds, and there's about 40 left. Um, donors received a name certificate uh, with a, this, the brick number, um, and they say the photo showing its location. That brick number number one is mine, of course, as you'd expect, um, but you can't actually see it because now we put the guttering up, <laughs> it's hidden out of view, <laughs> Never mind. 
Okay, um, and we use the crowdfunder for, as I mentioned earlier, three separate campaigns, and the first one raised over 13,600. Um, and there's lovely people at Derbyshire Wildlife Trust had to send certificates all over the place. They went far and wide, there were several hundred of them. They even went to Australia. And here's one of our members, Georgina. Hello, my name's Georgina, and I've bought a brick. I live in Sydney, Australia, and I've been looking and enjoying this site for over three years that my daughter introduced me to. I'm so impressed with everything that you do, and I just think it's wonderful. You have so many beautiful volunteers, um, and to watch it grow from where it came, it's just wonderful. Love to see it, and thank you for this opportunity to tell you. Well, Georgina, as I say, one of hundreds of people who are very proud owners of the uh, of their bricks. So then some really good news in July, um, because we received planning consent from Amber Valley Council. And then straight away afterwards, uh, we appointed uh, the builder, Andrew Churchman, um, who is very experienced in restoration of old buildings and, and he's done lots of projects in Derbyshire. And then in the November, Lisa secured a £35,000 grant from the Pilgrim Trust which is the largest single donation of the project. Um, so we've got now £50,000 in the bank, so the funding for stage one of the restoration was secured, and we could finally make a start. So there can be no more exciting moment on, on a restoration than when the first spade goes in the ground, and that certainly was the case for our new team of volunteers uh, turned up for day one for the restoration. And uh, I have to say it was the start of an amazing 13 weeks, uh, which I captured in some photos and put in a five minute video, which uh, I then uh, posted uh, for the team. So I'll play you that now. It's uh, a, a warning, the captions do move fairly quickly.
Well, I never tire of watching that. Okay, so um, Andrew's first stint on the cottage uh, was between January and March 2020 when he tackled a number of problems and he was obviously quite keen to get to this one. There, were, there was a tree growing out of the corner, so it meant dismantling the corner of the building to get at the, uh, the tree, um, removing it and then building uh, the wall back up, which he did. And the second uh, task was uh, this problem of the uh, underpinning. So we had to dig a hole that was about a metre deep and a metre across uh, so that Andrew could um, create a, a solid foundation. In the meantime, the building was held up by these steel beams. Uh, the job was done. It set us back about two or three weeks, um, but it was necessary to get that done. After which uh, he turned to repairing the uh, inner walls and replacing the lintels on the windows. Um, this section, you remember, was propped up in the uh, years earlier because it had collapsed. Um, but the work was done uh, and um, he made steady progress um, dealing with each area. This is the wall head and they had to be taken down uh, between one and three uh, tiers of stone, I think, and then rebuilt. Uh, and the gable end at the south end had to be completely replaced because the, the stone was, was uh, uh, shattered. Um, looked lovely when he'd done it. I'm just skipping through these quickly. Um, but by, I think it was the 10th of March 2020, the government had announced the first COVID lockdown. And our volunteers wouldn't be seen on site again for another six months. But thankfully, Andrew was able to continue, um, which he did during April and July to finish off uh, the wall repairs, <clears throat> and including the wall heads, as you can see here. And this is a nice shot of the parlour in July 2020, uh, showing the reclaimed oak beams and window lintels he fitted. That was, uh, so it's, yes, October 2020, uh, before our volunteers were next involved with the project. And this was a special day on the 28th. Because uh, the wall heads had finished um, and the roof timbers were ordered and delivery arranged for the 28th of October. However, a couple of days before the delivery was due, the supplier called to explain that their lorry couldn't, uh, it was too big to get down the track to the wharf shed, which is our usual drop off point for materials. Um, so I put a call into Hugh Potter at the Friends of Cromford Canal to ask if we could borrow their boat, Birdwood, which you can see in the photograph. And within an hour, I got a, a call back to say they would like to help. Um, and Hugh continues the story in this short video. As well as contributing financially to the restoration of the cottage, Friends of Cromford Canal were delighted to be asked to help transporting the long and heavy roof timbers from Cromford Wharf to the cottage. After all, this is what our 80-year-old narrowboat Birdwood was designed for, and probably replicated how the cottage was originally built over 200 years ago. So when I got the phone call one Tuesday from Ron, to ask whether on the Thursday we could stack the timber on the roof of what is now the passenger cabin of Birdswood to carry the timbers to the cottage, we were happy to quickly muster a crew. This not only fulfilled the objective, but also attracted a lot of media coverage for the project. What Hugh didn't explain uh, is that we also had to muster a crew to tow Birdswood from High Peak Junction to Leeward Pump House due to the excessive weed, because during COVID the boat hadn't uh, been used and therefore the weed hadn't been cleared. So um, that's what we had to do, as you can see us on the right there. But we finally got there and um, offloaded the timbers and carried them a short distance to the cottage. Uh, but also due to a slight problem with the, electric, the new electric motor in the boat, our volunteers also had to tow the boat all the way back to Cromford Wharf. Uh, not something they were expecting. <laughs> they were ready for a cup of tea when they'd done it. But it was still a brilliant day um, and we were very grateful to uh, the members of crew of Birdswood and the Friends of Cromford Canal for helping us out. So the next special moment 
uh, was on December the 3rd, um, when we started installing the floor joists in the cottage. All the timber for the first floor had been donated by Ilkes and Ilkes Supply and DIY, uh, because members of their team had been following the project. The purpose of installing the, the, the first floor at this stage was also to provide a working platform for the construction of the roof frame. Our volunteers installed the joists here on the kitchen side and Andrew uh, fitted them in the parlour because that required some special bolting to the uh, gable end. <coughs> Excuse me. The floor was laid uh, and covered uh, and then all of a sudden the cottage had rooms. And this is the parlour and we're looking at the fireplace end and at the other end. Then in January 2021, the long awaited reconstruction of the roof started and local builder, uh, sorry, local joiner, Phil Twig, um, he'd been watching the project and he kindly offered to do the job. So due to the remoteness of the cottage, every piece of this roof had to be cut uh, on site by hand and assembled on site. Um, Phil was the only um, joiner, uh, we had the assistance of Andrew and uh, volunteers uh, as required. Um, the large purlin timbers you can see there they were used as a working platform whilst the ridge beam was assembled. Um, and once the A-frame in the middle there was uh, constructed, these triple section purlins were installed. <coughs> Excuse me. Our volunteers got involved in drilling some of the sections that required bolting. Um, and once drilled, the A-frame and the purlins were bolted. The roof structure was designed by GCA uh, structural engineers in Derby. And it looked impressively strong, but it needed to be because it was going to carry five tons of stone tiles on the front. This is the view from the inside. This would eventually become the activity room. Final step was to install the rafters, uh, leaving spaces for the uh, heritage roof lights. And the roof frame was finally uh, completed by Phil on the 11th of February 2021. An amazing accomplishment, given that Phil was the only, say, qualified uh, joiner on the job. The remoteness of the site uh, and the challenges uh, due to the shape of the building, because it's actually slightly narrower at one end than the other, um, and working in the depths of winter. Super job. So once it was completed, Andrew then covered the roof with Tyvek, which is uh, to provide weather protection. Uh, for the whole building. Then uh, in freezing temperatures on a February morning, our volunteers then had the task of transferring the roof tiles to the cottage because they've been sat in a, a compound at the wharf shed for about a year. And they were heavy. The largest stones uh, had to be carried individually on sack barrows. You see Dave there with one and um, they weighed about 60 kilos and were about a meter square. And some of the smaller ones uh, went in a, um, a power barrow that we uh, kind of had loaned to us by Cromford Canal and <coughs> Codner Park um, Reservoir a Volunteer Group. Uh, it's a long trek back to fetch another load. And when we got them to the cottage, they were stored in the compound, graded according to size, because they'd be later um, fitted in reducing courses, starting with the largest first. So 9th of March, the chimneys had been built uh, using reclaimed red brick uh, to match the original chimneys of the cottage. Uh, and Andrew was installing the roof lights uh, and started fitting the Welsh slate on the back. Again, same as the original cottage had. And it soon made a wonderful sight. Then he turned to the front and we were treated to some uh, wonderful craftsmanship as Andrew carefully reassembled uh, the Derbyshire Free Birch stone tiles into what was a became a spectacular new roof. Starting with the largest tiles first, they're laid out on the ground between two pegs, which measured the length of the roof, and they're edged, necessary. They're edged to be trimmed to make sure there's a precise fit. Then the tiles were hoisted uh, to the roof, uh, and bearing in mind the weight, that was no easy task. Uh, then they're drilled and pegged to hang on the battens. The same process uh, is repeated for uh, each course, which uh, gradually reduced in size towards the ridge. So huge tiles at the bottom and the ones at the top were probably no bigger than a, uh, a paperback. And on the 8th of April, the final ridge tile was cemented onto the cottage's new roof. And what a joy it was to behold. 
The new roof looks stunning. Thanks in part to obviously the natural stone, but also thanks to Andrew's uh, craftsmanship in, in its construction. And so even with the, uh, the scaffolding obscuring the view, you get a sense of how the original cottage would have looked. And we loved our quirky ridge. And this is a drone view showing the stones at the front and the Welsh slate at the back, which is exactly how the original cottage would have been. And the reason for that, by the way, is when they uh, extended the cottage, they took the stone tiles from the back of the original part of the cottage and put them on the front to match and then uh, retile the whole of the back with the cheaper Welsh slate. This is how it looked. Um, <clears throat> so located on the wood edge of a woodland, uh, the tiles will green up and they've started to do that now. But this photo reminds us how absolutely stunning it looked on day one. Okay. From April, 2021, Derbyshire Wildlife Trust allowed uh, some more volunteers back on site. And during the next two to three months, our focus turned to the Leewood Steps. Now, this is the job we'd started at the beginning of the project in October 2019. I can tell you, building these 50 steps up this steep woodland bank was a Herculean task for our volunteers. And it's actually the biggest challenge they, they would face on the entire project. But the end result is something that um, we're very proud of, as you'll see in a minute. The, the challenge at this point was that the, uh, the gradient of the steps we were building was less than the gradient of the bank. And so we had a problem when we came to this point because the bank became very steep, as anybody that uses it will know. Um, so Alex Morley said, well, just uh, turn right, build a new platform and then come back on yourself. Now, I have to say, we were very sceptical, all the volunteers, that this was actually work, but Alex was adamant it would. Um, so we just followed his instructions and he was absolutely right. Uh, it managed, uh, it, we got around the problem and we were um, able to cut through uh, the bank to continue to the top. But there were some challenges. Uh, there's this uh, stone, which is absolutely enormous, and um, I calculated it weighed over a tonne, um, and we had to resort to uh, Stonehenge techniques of levers and wedges to get the damn thing up into its position. Um, but we did, and then we were able to continue. And we would progress by removing tons and tons of stone and rock and soil, um, progressing at a rate of about two steps a day. Uh, but all that stone and rock had to be removed and brought down. This, this is the stone at uh, one part of the site. But the soil, uh, which wasn't really suitable for the garden, all had to be bagged up and taken 300 yards down to skips at the wharf shed. And there were a lot of bags and a lot of barrowing. So I call in some additional volunteers uh, from site and within a day or so, um, newest members of the public volunteered to help. Uh, a small army was uh, help, uh, helping there to, to actually barrow the <laughs> soft down to the, uh, the skips and we cleared it in a couple of days. That was absolutely fabulous. As I say, we progressed to the top about two steps a day um, gradually putting the posts in, um, building the stone walls for that uh, new landing that we'd build. Uh, and one of our volunteers even made the, um, the brackets for the handrails. I uh, see Dave here putting them in, and Tony making a, a stone seat. Uh, and we put lead cappings on the tops of the posts, and it made a really super job. So now these steps are there for everybody to use. And even a, a new map of, the, uh, of Lee Wood at the top. Now this is where we started. Um, a dangerous muddy bank, um, which is the access into the wood in 2019. And this is what we created. Absolutely fantastic. Okay, next job. About the same time the steps were being worked on, uh, from around mid April, uh, another group of volunteers started to tackle the rebuilding of the dry stone wall in the South Garden. So this task was led by our walling duo, Ian and Kay Briggs and was completed over a 10 week period. Uh, it was probably the most challenging dry stone wall project we had to do. Um, we actually got uh, some advice from one of the UK's top dry stone wall experts who said that the wall that we we're gonna build need to be twice as thick. So it meant cutting back a meter into the bank and creating new foundations. So I had to take all that soil out, all the roots out all, um, and to create the foundations so that Ian and Kay could uh, start rebuilding them. And gradually, 
they did using whatever stone was available on site. Uh, it was a painstaking job, I can tell you. Um, but layer by layer, they built it up until complete. And there you go, an absolute thing of beauty. So proud of, uh, as I know they are, of, um, of what they did here. Uh, and other members of the volunteer team helped as well. So in 2015, the Chris Pike report uh, picked out a photograph that he got before the trees were cut down. And this is the state of the wall. It was obviously completely wrecked. And that's what we have today. Okay, so this is June, I think, uh, 2000, yeah, June 2021. Meanwhile, uh, so a little earlier in May, we also managed to install some rather special guttering. Now this material that we use called Alitech, and uh, again, it was provided free of charge. Uh, Marley Alitech Limited uh, sent it to us. Um, it's actually powder coated aluminium formed to look like cast iron, which is what the original cottage would have had, but it's significantly lighter. So it's easier to install and easier to maintain. Uh, well, easy if you've got a straight building, which of course we didn't. Um, so our volunteers, uh, Ian uh, Hooker and Richard Russell took on the task of doing this, and it was not easy, as you can imagine, with bent walls um, to get a straight uh, straight pipe to line up with the tiles. But they did it, and they did an absolutely fantastic job. The dam pipes and drains were completed uh, shortly afterwards. Another super job. And the next uh, task was the landscaping of the north garden, and that involved creating tiers in the bank so we could have some level areas for planting. And this was a brilliant idea, uh, devised by uh, another of our, of our volunteers, Rosie Stewart, who also led the design of the planting scheme for this garden. It involved moving lots of stone, lots of soil, uh, and building a couple of uh, dry, small uh, rustic walls. But the end result, I think uh, you'll agree, is absolutely stunning. This is now a beautiful corner of the site. On the 5th of June, Another long awaited moment was the removal of the scaffolding. Now we've been staring at this structure for the past you know, 15 months, much longer than expected. Uh, so it was a relief to see it finally come down, which happened over a morning, and we could start to see un the unfettered outline of the cottage for the first time. And what a lovely thing it, it was. And this is one of my favorite photos actually, because. Um, there's just something about the proportions of the cottage and the way it sits in the hillside and, and its natural setting, just beautiful. And that stone roof and uh, how it marries up with the, the stone, just, just lovely. I forgot to mention, by the way, those stone tiles were uh, previously on a Derbyshire barn for about a century. But if I was to pick up a, a favorite moment over the past five years, it would have to be the 7th of June, 2021, when the new windows arrived on site. They were manufactured uh, out of Akoya timber, which is suitable for, for windows, uh, made by Brinard's Joinery and Summercoats, to a design which uh, replicated the original window frames, and that's characterized by a, a central uh, uh, swivel opening. Um, Brinard's also supplied the front door, which we had painted it black, which contrasted nicely with the gritstone walls. <coughs> Excuse me. It was an exciting moment to see the first window fitted um, and then throughout, throughout the course of the morning, um, Phil got the rest of them installed. And as onlookers, we you know watching a transformation taking place. And what a picture. To my mind, this was the day we saved Aqueduct Cottage. The building was watertight, secure, and it looked magnificent. And we also felt we got it pretty close uh, to how the original uh, cottage looked. This is a photo from about a century ago. This was a very special moment indeed. In fact, <clears throat> it was almost five years uh, to the day um, when I'd actually seen the cottage for the first time in, in summer 2016. And uh, this, uh, this image, this before and after picture was put on the Facebook page and there's over 112,000 views. Okay, so moving on. The final landscaping job of the project for that year was probably one of the most enjoyable, planting of the uh, North Garden. 
Uh, as I mentioned, it was designed by Rosie uh, and, and agreed with Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. All the plants were donated by volunteers and members of the public. Um, and although it was uh, late September, we wanted to get them in. And we're really looking forward to this spring, obviously, to see them start to blossom. And around about the same time, um, our volunteers uh, were given some training on lime mortaring by Andy Lawson from Limecraft. Um, and over the past few months, um, as weather conditions have allowed, our volunteers have been practicing their skills, uh, uh, pointing the walls of the activity room, and also rebuilding the wash house, which is uh, in and Kay's project at the moment. Um, both are still a work in progress, um, but the results are looking pretty impressive. And we're on track to get uh, both finished over the next few weeks. In fact, with a bit of luck, we're hoping to get all the remaining jobs uh, done on the cottage by the end of July, early August, in time for the summer holidays. And we're confident it'll become a really great new visitor attraction in the Durham Valley. Um, and I think it'll punch above its weight. But none of this would have happened um, without um, the amazing support that we've had um, from individuals and organizations from across the community. It's been a true community-led project in my view, and that's been one of the most heartwarming aspects of it all. There are three main groups. Uh, the first one on this slide, um, these are the organizations which have uh, made a special contribution to the project right from the beginning, starting with the partnership between Derbyshire Wildlife Trust and uh, DHBT. Then there's eight funders, um, uh, Pilgrim Trust, as of course I mentioned, is the largest, largest uh, funder. About £90,000, I think, has been raised in total. And of course, we would not have this fantastic building that we have today without um, the skill and craftsmanship of our, uh, of our builders uh, who are listed there. The second group are our community supporters. And there's been a plethora of donations of all kinds uh, over the term of the project, free materials, services, or people just giving their time. And uh, the latest one, if you just look at the top of the second column, Dill Childs, who lives in Crete, uh, has phoned up and sent a voucher for the rose over the front door. How lovely is that? So finally, the third group are amazing volunteers. Um, over the past two, year, two and a bit years, and we've had 54 volunteers in total. We've got a core of about a dozen now, um, but they contributed over 4,000 hours on this project since October 2019. How much has that saved? The project. They're just a lovely, lovely bunch of people who have literally carried the project to this exciting stage we're at today. And the volunteers, by the way, are all ages um, from, from 14 to 80, uh, all fitness levels, um, and they're prepared to work in all, all weathers. It's opened my eyes to the benefits that volunteering can bring. And obviously, there's tremendous camaraderie amongst the team. Um, but I'll hand you over now to uh, Dave Goodridge, who's um, one of our team for to share his thoughts on the, on the experience. I've been trying to think how to summarise the past three years of working on Aqueduct Cottage um, for this video and share some of my thoughts. Um, and I find it really hard to do. It has been an absolute pleasure. Um, I got involved really by accident, just by seeing the cottage re-emerge from, um, from the undergrowth when it was first starting to be cleared. Um, I've been working on it you know, once a week, sometimes twice a week since then, um, and it has been a real joy. Working with a fantastic bunch of people, um, learning some new skills, um, working alongside some really skilled craftsmen. Um, the physical exercise, being out in the fresh air in such a wonderful natural environment, um, all those things have, have been um has been fantastic for me but probably most of all it's the pride in seeing this historic building um coming back to life um what a privilege to be able to be involved in that thanks dave couldn't agree more before i finish um there is one more important behind the scenes person i'd like to acknowledge and that of course is my wife uh vicky um has really well They've been a tremendous support to me. This has been a, a labour of love um, over the past few years. And so without, without her incredible patience and support and encouragement, I couldn't, I couldn't have done it. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, I hope you've, uh, it's given you an insight into our amazing little project. We certainly all love it. Um, 
And it just goes to show what can be achieved when a community pulls together. And I hope when it's opened in the summer, please do go and see it. Uh, I heard on the radio this morning, uh, apparently Historic England have launched a new campaign um, for, for such buildings. Um, and they said, you don't have to visit a castle to engage in heritage. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Ron, for what can only be described as an astonishing story. And I know others feel that because of the comments they've already put in the chat box. Uh, but uh, Ron, we'll take questions now. If you'd like to put your questions in the chat box, um, I will uh, pass them on to him one by one. Um, Ron, someone's asking you what your next project might be. <laughs> <laughs> My wife has got a long uh, DIY list ready for me. <laughs> no, no projects lined up at the moment. Just getting this one finished. Um, um, Valerie's wondering about what the facilities are on site, water supply, toilets, etc. Okay, so um, one of the things we need to do by uh, uh, September uh, is to restore the privy, uh, which I didn't talk too much about. And the, the plan is to install a composting toilet in that um, as we get to that, there'll be a toilet facility. Um, but the cottage will remain uh, pretty much off grid uh, as the original cottage. And we'll be putting uh, hopefully a, a renewable power source in uh, to provide some lighting, but that would be it. The nearest uh, facility is going to be High Peak Junction, which is a few moments to walk down the canal. That's great. Um, a lot of people saying they can't wait to visit. When when can people visit, Ron? Well, <laughs> I've set targets before and missed them. Um, our plan is to get the cottage finished for the summer holidays. So end of July, early August, when it'll be open to the public. The specific days, um, while I've trust have yet to decide, but it'll obviously be during the busy periods. Uh, it'll be manned by uh, volunteers um, to welcome visitors. So this, this summer, all being well. Brilliant. Um, or oh, someone here missed the beginning of the talk and wondered what the original purpose of the cottage was. I don't know if you want to go into that now. Uh, just briefly, it was a lengthened cottage. Uh, Peter Nightingale built um, uh, the Leewood Arm, um, had to have a stop uh, lock at the entrance of, of that uh, uh, the Leewood Arm due to the agreement he'd got with the Cromford Canal Company. That needed to be operated by a, a lock keeper. And that's the reason that Aqueduct Cottage was built in 1802. Brilliant summary. Um, hopes for the future use of the space? Well, the interesting thing about this is that um, the Wildlife Trust do see this as a, a good model, the community of volunteers being involved to look after quite a unique asset within their reserves. Um, and to some extent, it's going to be down to a community group of uh, volunteers to realise its potential. And we were obviously saving the building, as we've said, for um, visitors to look at the interpretation downstairs to learn about the history of the place and, and Lee Wood and the, and the uh, Dermot Valley and also use the room upstairs. I mean, from a sleepover to uh, an exhibition, or it's available for community groups to use. How it develops after that will be down to Derbyshire Wildlife Trust and the community group of volunteers it works with. But there's obviously potential for all kinds of events in such a such a lovely building in a stunning part of the Dermot Valley, uh, from exhibitions to live performances, you name it. It's, it's, it's got lots of potential. Um, so we'll look forward to that developing. Absolutely. Um, someone here may have already done a, a building project from the sounds of it. The question is, did the project remain within the original budget? And how did you <laughs> manage any unforeseen costs? Uh, no, it didn't. Um, and occasionally that's why we had three crowdfunders and Wildlife Trust have been superb in, in, in raising money through corporate donations as well. Um, and it's evolved. Uh, it is, though, I think you'll agree, a shoestring budget. Um, but I think we've had about £90,000 raised. Um, but thanks to obviously thousands of hours from a team of volunteers, uh, it saved a lot of uh, cost in that way. 
Um, but it did run over the original budget, but um, we're stay at the moment, we're in a good place. Um, we believe we've got now sufficient funds to get it finished. Um, with obviously so much of it done, there's less to, to do in the future, so we can be confident that um, that will happen. That's excellent. Um, Hillary's asking if there are, there are any plans to restore the leeward arm of the canal. Um, no, um, there aren't. Um, there's a, a short section of about 100 metres, I think, from the cottage to the railway bridge. Uh, that I know that while I trust are thinking about doing something there for, for maybe some dipping, pond dipping for um, the children events and things like that. But no, not to restore the rest of the, uh, the canal. No, and uh, I think Which Karen... is a very lovely walk away along that towpath to, to Leeridge. Yes, um, Kevin was asking if there are any plans to restore the lock which gave the cottage its purpose. Yes, partially. Um, we've, uh, as you've seen in that uh, video, we've restored the stone recess um, and it's our hope, uh, and we're in discussion with various people about this, to find uh, a gate that would be suitable. It wouldn't be operating, of course, it's just, uh, uh, just for show, but we do intend to put, uh, if we can, a, uh, a gate there with some interpretation to explain uh, why it's there, because that, of course, sets the context, as I said earlier, for why the cottage was built. Mm. Um, just to say, a lot of people are saying excellent talk, thank you, and that people are in awe of both yourself and the volunteers and everyone else who made it possible. That's a really nice comment. It's nothing short of miraculous. Um, is, it, is, is it in listed building status? Yes. Yes, it is. Grade two listed. Uh, and it's a significant part of the Derwent Valley Mills World Heritage Site. Indeed it is, yeah. That's all the questions I can see, unless I've missed anything. Um, if people want to unmute themselves and ask themselves, that's fine. Yeah, well, thank you very much for uh, um, everybody for your kind, kind words. Um, and thanks again to, well, as you've seen, the number of organizations of people involved um, and uh, it's thanks to that great team that we are where we are and we, we really look forward to getting it open so it can be enjoyed by lots of people for generations to come. Well we must thank you Ron for our absolutely marvellous and gripping presentation um, if I can just if I, if I can just conclude by um, a, an advertisement um, the Derbyshire Historic Buildings Trust is um, putting on a um, walk along the canal on Sunday the 23rd of October, led by Mark Summerfield and George Jones. George Jones is um, co-author of the Mansell Report that Ron referred to in glowing terms, and they will lead a walk along the canal for the Derbyshire Historic Buildings Trust on Sunday the 23rd of October. That's probably going to be limited to about 20 people. So um, that'll be advertised much nearer the date. But finally, a final huge thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Everyone. Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks. Goodbye, Willie.